Dharma is your duty to your own soul. Dollars make bigger dharmas doable. Make the most of your spins around on planet Earth. Welcome to the Dharma and Dollar Show with your hostess with the mostest, Kate Stillman. If you're repulsed by money, success, PL statements, productivity hacks, don't listen. Stick to the Yoga Healer Body Thrive episodes released every Monday. But if you yearn for money talk, investments for your activism, real numbers in real time, if you want to get greedy for the good of all, stick around. And ask yourself before we begin, what do you want to make happen next? Hello, it's Kate Stillman. Welcome back to the Yoga Healer Real Life Show. On today's show, I talk with Alexandria Crow. When I hopped on, I hadn't realized that Alex was one of the two hardtail gals who I had seen on the back of the Yoga Journal cover for the past decade. I was actually always blown away by those hardtail ads. For those of you who don't know hardtail, there's a great yoga clothing company. In this episode, Alex really talks about what happens when you know you really push your body to pose in level three poses consistently. She went through some Ashtanga-based injuries before slowing her practice way down and teaching in her own integrity. So in this conversation with Alex, you can eavesdrop on us as two seasoned yoga teachers discussing the evolution of the practice and the teaching in our own lives. She also talks about the the mix between the sedentary lifestyle and the intense practice and how that leads to injury. Like when we sit on our desk all day and then show up for like a level two flow, uh, not so good. And we get into a lot of these, these things that can really disrupt our, our practice. And we're maybe not putting together the lifestyle and what we're actually doing in the classroom. So Advanced teachers will start to co-create much more with their students if they are an advanced teacher. This is a great episode for teachers and students of yoga alike to start to look at what they're doing and start to go to the next level of integrity in your personal practice or in your classroom. Stay tuned. Do you want to have a conversation about your wellness career? Sometimes it's hard to find someone who actually knows something about advancing a wellness career in your friend group or in your peer group. And that's why at yogahealer.com and yogahealthcoaching.com, we take it seriously. Like we really want to see wellness leaders and yoga teachers and body workers and holistic practitioners, as well as doctors and nurses who have a wellness mindset. We want to see you thrive. So you can go to yogahealthcoaching.com forward slash have dash a dash conversation and sign up. And you can talk to my very own Grace Edison, like I'm claiming you, Grace, you are mine. You can talk to Grace about your wellness career and she can point you to resources that we have within our site. She can give you some advice. And if you're a good fit for one of our programs, she can let you know which one we can recommend so that you get the results that you're looking for. So if you really just want to sit down and have a conversation with someone who gets it about your wellness career, go to yogahealthcoaching.com forward slash have dash a dash conversation. Grace is an awesome person to talk to. You're going to love it. Take that appointment very seriously so you get the most out of it. Have a conversation. I'm here with Alex Crow of yogaphysics.com. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. So I'd, I'd love to just start off by why why did you create yoga physics? Like what's the background behind this combo yoga and physics? Well, I mean, one, I always joke. It was actually my friend who made it up. He's a, he's a brand uh, manager and designer. And uh, he, we were talking about like how I teach and I was moving in a different direction at that time. And I was trying to differentiate kind of what I was doing, but I wasn't a brand in that sense. It was more like, how do I describe what I do when it's a little bit different than what's out there? And uh, he was like, you're like math. You should make it like yoga physics. And now it's really convenient because energy into matter can change anytime I wanted to. Um, so it makes it really easy. But uh, I did it mostly uh, because I wanted to have something that I didn't have to use my name for, which is pretty funny, just because I'm not terribly comfortable with my, like with being out just with my name only. So it was just to do that. But I actually don't, I don't give people certificates. I don't have like a particular like brand that's packaged up and formatted. So it's actually just like, I used to be a graphic designer and it's just a pretty looking, pretty looking thing. And so that's it, which is pretty fun. Well, it's a good 
skill set. I mean, a lot of yoga teachers don't realize how much exactly like how much uh, marketing they're going to need to do in order to make exactly. a living at this. That's a that's a very convenient skill set, huh? Indeed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all the things line up, as they say. So makes it easy. Yeah. Awesome. So tell me what, so in terms of like what, what goes on in your classroom, so that is a little bit different. That is, is mm -hmm. what you are doing. Yeah. Let's get into that. Yeah. I started as a, it was an Ashtangi by practice. I also taught Ashtanga for, for a while and I was a vinyasa teacher. I talk about it a lot. It's not necessarily, uh, I speak about it for really specific reasons, but I'm not uh, like heavily identified with being an injured person, but I talk about injury and how those practices didn't really work for me long term, and how injured I ended up getting. And uh, when I started realizing, it's a slow process, especially back then, because nobody was really talking about it all those years ago when that started to happen to me. That you know, hey, by the way, maybe you shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff. It was like, hey, do this. This is a good idea. Look at look at how enlightened you're going to be. Um, so then I just had to start to figure out a little at a time what had happened. And I started to realize over years that I'd hurt myself doing asana. I thought it was gymnastics at the beginning, but it didn't line up. And eventually I started realizing that it was actually what I was doing on a mat that was hurting me. So it's been this process of dismantling everything um, and deconstructing all of the physicality that goes into a physical practice. And then looking uh, philosophically at what I'm trying to teach uh, from a yoga philosophy standpoint, and then reassembling movement and positioning that makes much more sense functionally and accomplishes philosophically what my aim was all along without so much risk. So that's that's what goes on in class. A lot of personal decision making, personal exploration, a lot more uh, choice than I would have given people before and a lot less uniformity, even in how quickly people move and whether they're at the same point uh, in, in an exploration. It's, it's very different than what I would have done years ago as like the breathlink movement teacher. So mm. that's where I am. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. a few things that come to mind, but like one is uh, I've been working on this in my, I'm writing a book right now on awake living and just with uh, pace, like with people finding the right pace, we're so used to not being in our own rhythm just from being a you know, typical person in a modern society where it's like the rhythm sort of dictated out outside of us, it goes against nature for the most part, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it goes against our intuition. And so on the mat is a place where we can reconnect with like, how do I feel like moving today? Do I want to move quickly? Do I want to move slowly? Do I want to move quickly right now and slowly in a minute? And like, mm -hmm. you know, and just that like rediscovery of, oh, what is, what is the rhythm of what am I attuning to? Yeah. And I think, you know, that's something that over the years I've really been looking at um, the idea of how a class functions and how a classroom is set up and what the power dynamics are and what the structure of a, of a yoga classroom is. And what's difficult is that it's set up uh, much more like a group fitness type class most often, which is uniformity. Everybody move at the same pace. Everybody do what I'm telling you to do, which doesn't allow for any of the exploration that you would want somebody to be able to have, which was actually why I really liked being a Mysore practitioner for all those years, because I don't like being told what to do at all. I want to figure out how to do things myself. So um, when I started to realize like in classrooms, people don't have the opportunity to do that if it's a led class. Yeah. And then they're completely dependent on a teacher. And I don't, I don't want to be you to be dependent on me, especially not long term. I want you to figure out yourself and your own pace well, and what you need. I mean, and that goes against what I mean, if yoga is fatantri or the path to, to freeing the self, like it doesn't make yeah. any sense. <laughs> Codependency not. isn't really in there. <laughs> no. And that's like the thing that I, I, I've been bringing up so often. And every weekend I'm, I'm usually somewhere new and I'll say like, have you ever thought of how we're telling students to figure out what works for them, but then we're telling them what to do. And we're telling them to take care of their bodies, but then we're the ones making decisions either verbally or via our hands about where they should be positioned in space. And it's a very interesting thing. It's like almost the dead opposite oftentimes of what we're asking people to do. So I'm, I'm heavily driven to kind of change that. At least from my standpoint, yeah, <laughs> best I can. Yeah, that's cool. Well, yeah. I mean, and there's been such an evolution in yoga too over the last, I mean, really since 
if we even just look like from like the early 90s until Mm -hmm. now, so we take like the last about 30 years and how many more people have done so much more yoga that we're not, it's like for so many people, we're not dealing with like, they've never done a class. They don't know, you know, it's like they know how to wiggle their fingers and find their toes and they know how to move their breath and they know Mm -hmm. how to, right. And so it's like, at some point there's like the diksha, right. Where there's that initiation they've gone through a certain amount of learning to now be able to explore at another level yeah and i think that that's something that even you know over the course of my my teaching i've noticed is that originally students didn't know what they were getting into i remember going to my first class i had no idea what i was getting into i was like what the hell is this going to be like but then nowadays they're even introduced via social media right, or via right. blog. So they've never done it, but they have so much more like seeming understanding of what they think they're going to do or what they think a yoga practice is. And then they end up, you know, being a little bit, they either go down that path where it's like, well, these are what the poses look like and it's fitness and this is what we're doing. Or they, get there. And if it's a class, that's not what they anticipated. There's like this immediate kind of buck back. And it's like, well, wait, most of what you're learning is via all these other mediums that aren't, aren't necessarily giving you the breadth of information you want. They're giving you what sells. And so it is an interesting animal to kind of deal with at this point. And then there's the practitioners that have been doing this for a long time. And I talk about it all the time. And I'm sure you have seen this too, that, there's a lot of people who've been around for a long time that won't go to studios necessarily anymore and that won't participate because they're not being served. And I'm like, wait, is anyone watching this? <laughs> this larger <laughs> phenomenon of like, the, yeah. yeah, of like the educated exodus. Yeah. I'm like, where, like, are you, who are you going to fill the studios with if you're not serving all of us at this point? So that's so fast. I hadn't even, re- I mean, someone asked me, they're like, when's the last time you went to a yoga class? I'm like, well, you don't want to but know. It's, well, exactly. <laughs> and it's something that I like, I ask a lot of questions every weekend. I get into this thing where I'm like, where are you at? Cause I travel yeah. so much and I need to know who I'm talking to. I'm not yeah. fab with anything. Like, yeah, cause you, you don't know them. Me. You're not in person. Yeah. No idea. Yeah. How would I know? So I asked them and it's amazing how many people like when you make the space for it, will admit, I don't go to studios. I don't want to do that. I don't do that. They have a guilt around it on oh, one hand yeah. because we were to- all told, you know, in order to teach asana, you must be doing the practice that you're teaching. And it's like, well, that's kind of not true entirely. Like you can, you should be a few steps ahead of what you're teaching, but not 97 steps ahead and like teaching way behind you. So once you give them space, they start to admit that. And I always say, especially when I'm in a studio, like with the owner in the workshop, who's going to fill the classes if we're not serving these people who are not going anymore? Like, what would it take to recapture you? What would it take to get you to go and do that again? Because it's possible, yeah. but it's not going to look like what's happening there. No, I mean, in, in my experience with, with um, what's gone on with Yoga Healer and developing these communities, it goes, it, it, you've got to go to the co-creative. It's like, you've got to, mm-hmm. you've got to nurture and nourish the skills because it's a totally different tool set of being able to co-create and learn and give feedback in the degree to which we can help each other that we can't do home alone in our own beautiful <laughs> space yeah. that we created for our own practice. Right. And that there's exactly. that gotta be and it's a totally different skill set. And so until we're teaching those skills and nurturing this or even getting curious about, hey, what are those skills? Like what would it take yeah. for us to do this as a teaching collective? Yeah. Like what would it take to to go and I mean I can tell you what I would be interested in and like what would recapture me. Um I don't know, you know, it would take a broader, broader conversation. Like most of most of what I, I get motivation out of or momentum or deeper understanding or curiosity is from talking to like-minded people about where they're at with anything and about what they're doing and how they see it and moving from that conversation, taking that out into what I'm doing. But it doesn't look like what you would think a yoga class looks like at this point, because it's mostly like dialogue and, you know, research and reading and those sorts of things. So it would be interesting to think about what, what it would take. Is that going yeah. on anywhere or have you started that anywhere? No, not yet. It's like, yeah, it's, no. an, it's, an, it's like, it's like the next wave kind of thing. Yeah. It's like, it's in its infancy because, you know, for, 
first of all, I don't move like that. Like, it's just not how my personality is to go and like, definitely like I have a brand that's not even really a brand. It's so ridiculous, but (laughs) I think that it's at that stage where there's still so much emphasis on what you see on social media and blogs or right. like that, all the yeah. postures, all this like vinyasa stuff. Yeah. And I know like my, my group of people is a different direction at this point, but I know that's not broadly popular and it's scary yeah. to people to think about shifting things. So I, I don't think it's quite at the stage where it's going to develop quite Well, yet. there's all these different generations too, right? I mean, if we look at what's going on with the whole social media thing, it's mostly people mm-hmm. in their 20s and 30s, right? Because yep. they're the social media generation. And then it's like what's yep. happening for people in their 50s and 60s who've been practicing yoga for 30 years. It's like, that looks really, really different. Really different. And then for those of us who are in our 40s, we're kind of like bridging. We're, we're like, yeah, yep. we can play the social media game. Like, yeah, we can do, throw up a YouTube channel. Like, yeah, we can do Facebook ads and run, you know, mm-hmm. we can handle, like we get that and we're not willing to just be like hey look at me yeah I mean that is a big it's always been an interesting place that I sit because I'm I'll be 39 this year and uh I sit like I straddle the line what I teach and what I would like practice or where my interests are 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 like in the 50s and 60s crowd people are always like you're you do you do things like Gary Crafts out and I'm like I I know I it's like you get to a certain point you kind of end up in the same place with a lot of people where it's like yeah yeah we we know sustainability we get it like you get really hurt you kind of get there really quickly if you're interested but then there's the whole like social media one where I mean I played into that by accident I didn't even know I didn't know the repercussions of that, which is why I've extracted myself out um, so heavily and speak so loudly about like, I don't do that anymore. I won't take pictures like that. I'm not doing it's It's contributing to a huge problem. And so, but it, I got in before it ever existed. So it was kind of fascinating. Like, you didn't know. <laughs> so, uh, oh, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting uh, journey, especially because I'm always like, constantly surveying what I'm doing and how it's rippling out. And when you get to see the ripple effect yeah. of your choices yeah. and other people's choices, yeah. it's like, hold on guys, are you paying attention over here? Cause this is crazy. What's happening? Yeah, we, we, we did something kind of nuts over here. Yeah. We're going yeah. to not do that anymore. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's the benefit oh. of being, I mean, it's interesting. I'm uh, very interested in, in leadership and sort of the reintegration of the feminine into into what's predominantly masculine leadership, right? Which is just what we do. And part of it is this, is this co-creative reflective, like conversation that it's like, okay, we can look back and be like that, that worked, but that part of it really had this weird thing going on. And so we're not gonna, (laughs) like, what else can we do? And there's that curiosity that, you know, right. That listening of like, does anyone else have a better idea here? Or like, what's, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> right. And then and then there's a hot, stronger integration that's much yeah. more collaborative in nature. And then there's the next evolution where the whole thing is more informed. And then everyone is actually much more part of something because they help create yeah. it. All right. In the second half of the show, Alexander talks about how yoga teachers and yoga studios can serve advanced students and how they currently don't. How that's somewhat the downfall of the success of many studios. I understand this. Like at a certain level, like people leave. They don't, they just develop a home practice and don't come back. So we look into what's going on there and how to actually build community with your advanced students and advanced practitioners and how to bring your teachers back into coming to classes. Stay tuned. You've done some serious work. You're operating at a higher level of consciousness. You know how to take care of your body. You'd like to uplevel other aspects in your life, your space, your time, your dharma, your flow, and your body. Ether, air, fire, water, earth. I'm taking a posse of peeps into the Awake Living course. 50 people will be selected to join this expedition. We're opening the doors to anyone who is feeling great and wants to uplevel how they align their life, time optimization, space alignment, hitting goals, wealth expansion, and day-to-day ease. If you're interested in awake living, we have a super fun process for you to experience. Go to yogahealer.com forward slash awake. Sign up for your free awake living coaching session. During your free awake living coaching session, you will refine the next version of you. As a bonus, you'll receive the 60-minute workshop, Insider Scoop, on how I optimize my day as a yoga mom, tribe leader, and social entrepreneur. Go to yogahealer.com forward slash awake and sign up for your free Awake Living coaching session.
Yeah. And I think that that's, that is what I see is, is very, um, intriguing to me because that's kind of where I come from. It's like, I would have had no idea that, you know, I did hardtail ads. I did those for a long time. And oh, you I, did? Love I was that wondering, because that's on your yeah. media page. I'm like, oh, she's in hardtail ads. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's, wow. I, that's cool. So like I've probably been looking at time. your butt for like, what, yes, 10 years? For like 10 years. Nice. <laughs> nice. Butt. And like, I think that that's like, that was really fun. I didn't, it was before Instagram was ever invented. It was before any of that. And like, I love them and their family. So that was why I kept doing it was because I actually loved the company and I loved that they were like American made and it was great. Um, but I didn't know that doing those photos would end up turning like that was part of what spurred Instagram photos on, like in retrospect, those were on the back of every yoga journal magazine. Yeah, and yeah. that was yeah, then you took pictures of fancy stuff. And yeah, what was funny is like when we were taking them, that was under, we were under no illusion that was a yoga practice. We were just taking pretty pictures. And as a former graphic designer, that's what I liked. Like I like, and I worked in the fashion industry. I liked that kind of aesthetic was really fun. But I, had I known now what I do now, I would have said like, I don't know if it's going to go so well. <laughs> but then when you tell people that, like, Hey, by the way, in retrospect, I can see the ripple effect of this and it was unwise and unskillful, but it wasn't, that wasn't the intention. It's just intent and outcome were, right. were not aligned. And if it wasn't you guys, it would have been someone else. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it was like, going to happen. It's going to happen. It's listen, it's going to happen. It was happening. It was happening in other places. It wasn't just me. I'm not even statistical enough to think like I was the only one, but like at that point, I just didn't know. And yeah. nobody does like, you don't know what the 200 hour teacher training developing like that and packaging it up Yeah, and then take yourself, you know, 15 years down the line and look at it and say like, Oh, well, maybe packaging that up and selling that was like a little, it had some problems with, with doing that so broadly. Um, but you know, you don't know until you do, and then you've got to be willing to have the conversation, which a lot of people are, and a lot of people are not like, they don't want to have that conversation uh, and they're like, it's fine. Everything's fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, to me, that's like, there's a, there's a lack of yoga in that not being willing to reflect. Like mm -hmm. there's a, just getting like, okay, no reflection is part of the cycle. The silence is part of the own. Like there's that, mm -hmm. right? Like there, like we need to, Shavasana is a pose. It's, yeah. it's not going to get in the back of yoga journal, but it is a, right. And it's like exactly. that assimilation part is what enables the entire next cycle to be smarter and better and more connected. Yeah. And I mean, I, what's, what I find so interesting right now, and I'd be interested to see what you think about it, but I find there are people who are willing to admit there's issues going on, that there are things that need to change or that there are parts of what we're all doing as a collective that aren't quite working and they're willing to kind of admit it sort of, but then not change what they're doing which I find the, an interesting animal. Cause I'm like, wait, wait, you got to do the, you see the problem. You let the old one die and then you do something new. <laughs> That's yeah. it, but it's kind of like this interesting time where everyone's like, yeah, I see there's a lot of injuries. There's a lot of misinformation, but I'm just going to continue contributing in that way. And I get it. Uh, I yeah. get it so heavily. Like I understand why people do that. And I am guilty of it myself at times. Like you just don't know how to go forward yet, but I think that's kind of where we are as a community right now. So interesting. Yeah. Well, I just interviewed mm -hmm. Donna Farhi on her new yeah. book, uh, which is like all about because she just gets injured yoga teachers more or less following her around that are like, yeah. you know, like put me back together again. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and, and so she, she went really deep in into that, but there's this, I, I love the, the, I use this for, you know, for my just entire philosophy and work life, but also like, picking up my home, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. just like the philosophy of Kaizen of small yeah. continuous improvement, which is like when we have a yeah. recognition of like, okay, something needs to change and it's big. And I know this is a direction, but it seems too hard and too big and I can't do it. And maybe if, especially if it's like income generating, that can be very right. hard to change. Of course. Uh, but then just saying like, what is the smallest thing? Like, what is the smallest thing I can do today? And what is the smallest thing then tomorrow that'll feed off the thing I did today? And that 1% mm -hmm. improvement is what will help us shift in as an industry. And I like yeah. that you're just saying like, Hey, let's talk about it. Like, like, let's bring this up. And that's what Donna's saying too. It's like, Hey, you know, we've got to talk about this. And actually, honestly, like the last like five yoga teachers I've talked with on the show are all saying the same thing, which is like, yeah, I got injured from doing, and it's 
to me, it's fascinating. And now I'm slowing down and blah, blah, blah. But it's it's interesting to see, too, if we look at, you know, we're if we're wild monkeys and we're mm-hmm. living this like fairly sedentary, totally bizarre lifestyle now yep. where we like we use furniture we sit right like we don't sit yeah. on the floor we don't sit like <laughs> we, we drive in trees buggies rather than walking <laughs> yeah we don't walk right we barely but. walk um and if we do and if we do exercise it's not intermittent it's like in a session that's followed by like a long period of sitting that might mm-hmm. be hours long oh yeah right and then and then we might even skip a day of not exercising and then we might go to a power yoga flow yeah. right and we might do that twice a week that power yoga flow that's working these really certain muscle groups but it's not balanced by intermittent walking throughout the day nope. it's not by these like i mean even if you think of like 100 years ago women used to wash their clothes the clothes by hand so they were squatting I talk about that all the time yeah right so we've like well, lost I mean, all thing. functional movement. And then we're trying to replace that with like power or whatever, this like really specific movements that aren't part mm-hmm. of a holistic human movement no, experience. experience at all. And I think that that's, yeah, I mean, I was just talking about that yesterday. That exact point was brought up and, and I was saying like, we expect this thing in yoga sold as healing. Like that's the thing is that's the major perception out there from people at this point. But then the postures off or most often and popularly these days are not even remotely healing. I mean, like that's down dog is not a healing thing to do. Is I mean, handstand is not a healing thing to do. It's just like, it's a pose. I was a gymnast for 18 years. I know those shapes very, very, very well, but I wasn't under any illusion that that was going to heal me. And then if you think about, okay, so we've got these poses that aren't inherently healing and then the concept of healing, and then people are really seeking, like I can say for the people that I come in contact with, they are looking for answers. Like they are like almost, I I don't want to say desperate, but you know, that feeling that you get from, like, they just want somebody to help them. And they'll almost believe like anything at a certain point I've been there. And so then it's like, well, if you just do the yoga class, or if you just go to the spin class, or if you just eat this way, or if you just, and they do all these little, like really dedicated mini things that aren't necessarily for them. That was, that worked for the person who thought it up for the most part. And there's not this like personal exploration of what will work holistically for them. And then they expect, you know, and we all do, we expect that we're not going to move around at all during the day. We're not going to walk. We're not going to walk up and down the stairs. I was talking about the centenarians the other day, like the, I think it's called the blue zones and how they have very similar traits and, you know, their work is their work and they do it because that's what you do in life is do work. And they walk around and they don't do exercise. They move in their life, be it like riding a bike or walking up and down stairs. And so there's, and and they do something that makes them feel joy and like they eat food that's local and whatever makes them happy and not in excess. And those are some very basic things, but I think like we want to keep everything the way it is and just band aid stuff from the outside. So it's like, I want that yoga class to solve all my problems. The one hour every couple of days or that one spin Mm -hmm. class or, you know, and I think that that's, that is contributing to a lot of the injury and a lot of what's happening out there for sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's even bizarre to think of like how yoga arose with functional movement, (laughs) right? And now you're like, okay, we're just going to take all the functional movement out, but we'll, and then we're going to make the yoga more intense and we'll see what happens. And it's like, okay, that hurts something. Yeah. Sorry about that. (laughs) Yeah. Oh wait, none of none of you are fourteen year old boys. Oh shoot, sorry, we didn't take that into account. Um, it's, it's, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Totally. Yeah. Sink that one in, everyone. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I do it every weekend because oh. I teach the first the first session out of any weekend workshop series that I do is a philosophy lecture, a uh, philosophy and history lecture because I need framework. I can't. Otherwise, it just seems like I'm teaching you, like dismantling us and I'm teaching you biomechanics, which I'm interested in, but I'm only driven to know that so I can teach philosophy and yoga better. But I say it every weekend. I'm like, I look around the room and I'm like, okay, still haven't found one. No 14 year old Indian boys. Okay. Yeah. Can we move on? Can we not be so attached to this thing anymore? Because that's, that it really wasn't designed for our population of people, to be honest. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Amen. 
Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and then just really getting that, like, over time, as yoga's evolved, it's if we look at, like, the yoga explosion in the last 30 years, like, that's good. Like, now we have diversity, mm-hmm. right? We don't have, yep. like, one or two systems with with male figures that yep. really were, had, had uh, women taking care of food and children, mm-hmm. right? Like, not integrated. And we look at, like, most, most people that are practitioners are women who are take can take care of food and children right and yeah. themselves and have a job right yeah. so it's like it's like a totally different type of the species yeah. right that we're and then it's like what is what should the practice what should the practice look like now because now we've had diversity like we've had mm-hmm. we we have more kinds of yoga out there than ever we have more kinds of certifications to be teachers of certain kinds of yoga, oh, yes. like then than ever and and you know i mean the, it kind of brings up this interesting thing too where it's like popularity doesn't mean something's good good <laughs> or proven it right it no. just means like someone's like really good at marketing themselves which is awesome like mm-hmm. and has a piece and a part of the puzzle but but that whole sense of like what what we're finding now as yoga's evolved at this point of like okay if it doesn't have functional movement you're gonna hurt people right mm-hmm. if it if you're not getting people into their own experience, then you're creating another sort of codependent relationship, right? We're starting to yep. see these like these truths. If we don't awaken the historical like deal with that, most of this is coming from men. Like then we're missing that. Like okay, most of the practitioners are women. Where we're enabled to co-create the conversation with the people in the classrooms. Like what do you yeah. what do you need, and how can we serve you with the history of yoga and the history of of all this diversification of movement and and start to plug in in a way that's much more experimental. Yeah. And I think like, that's why, that's why everything I'm really grateful to my teacher for really heavily pushing me to understand and continually study philosophically what, what the attempt was and from all sorts of different angles, just to look at it from many angles and to look at it throughout history and to say like, what is the aim here? What are we trying to do? Well, of course it's evolved somewhat because I don't think anyone's like going to become a renunciant in the caves at this point. I mean, maybe some people are, but I don't think you can sell that broadly. Um, so, uh, maybe one day if things keep going the way they're going, I'm just like, that's where I'm headed. I'm going back to Canada. I'm going to a cave, but, um, I don't think that that's the aim for most people, but I, what I can say is that when I'm asking and questioning people every weekend where what it comes down to and what I see is how there's so much chasing of what you're told to do and what is important and how things should be and distraction and uh, rule following in the like, you have to get this job or this education um, or mm-hmm. have this kind of house or this lifestyle or whatever it may be. And there's no time for self-discovery anymore. And because it's kind of like, well, you can be anything that you want, that that broadness has left people not knowing what to choose or how to figure out what they're good at or where they belong or, or what works for them. So I think that people feel this sense of like they don't fit in in some capacity, like broadly. They just are a little bit like, I just don't, I'm not happy because I have done what I was supposed to, or I can't accomplish what I've been told I have to. And I don't know how to go forward. And I don't look like the magazine and I don't have the, you know, life that I see pictured that is supposed to be mine. And I just want to, I just want to feel at ease with myself. And I just want to feel at ease with who I am and what I'm doing and be able to be like skillful with that. And so then they're sold so much stuff, you know, be it from the fitness industry or the yoga industry or the fashion industry or the nutrition industry. Like, I don't care where you look, you're being sold something that it's going to be the cure all. And I think that they're lost at this point, like this ever never ending 24 hour news cycle. And uh, widely available information is awesome on one hand. However, to sift through it and figure out what works for you and to take the time is hard. So I think if we could serve them in that way, where it's like, no, you got to figure out you. Yeah. But it's so cool to even hear that. Cause I remember like when I was in, like in the nineties, when I was doing yoga, like that was not who yoga was attracting. It was like people who knew what they were, what they wanted. And that's why they found yoga. Cause like you had to look, <laughs> you yeah. had to like go searching to find it then it wasn't yeah. on the corner, you know? And so, you know, yeah. it was like, if it was somewhere, it was like held in like the church basement on Mondays yeah. at 7 AM or something, you know what I mean? It was like, so not just out there, but what's cool now mm-hmm. is we're attracting the mainstream and the mainstream is like 
you know, WTF. Um, yeah. I, I bought the Kool-Aid and I don't <laughs> like the taste of it anymore. And it's polluted me. Like what, like help, help me figure this out. So it, I mean, that whole practice of, of Svadhyaya and, and Vairagyam of like, you know, like self-study and don't be attached yep. to whoever you were before. And if we yep. can bring that message home to like loosen up some of those shackles and your beliefs and some of the idea of what, of what your life is supposed to look like. And, and that's what we're here to do in this sacred time and space yeah. together. Yeah. And I think that that's, I I'm with you. I, I knew what I wanted for the most part when I found, when I went and, and started practicing, I was like, I need something for this. This is not working for me. Um, but I think that people are still in that place, but then they come to class, like we talked about at the beginning, uh, and they're told, like, put your feet here, put your hands here, yeah. this is how it goes. Yeah. And so I spend so much time, like, showing them via um, some teaching tools of, like, putting stickers on them and showing them, like, look how different you all are. Do you see how different you are? Like, yeah. your faces are different. Do you not understand everything is different? So, and it's really relieving to a lot of them. The things that I hear every weekend are so they're like heartbreaking and heartwarming all at once where mm -hmm. people will say like, I've been trying to do up dog for years and it kills the top of my feet every time it comes up, but I don't know what else to do. And now you just told me that my, my ankles don't do or don't plantar flex the way that I would need them to. So I don't have to do that anymore. And I'm so relieved and I'm not going to care that I'm not doing it anymore. And I'm like, well, there's something now do that just with everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's fine. No, never. Oh, <laughs> there's the secret. <laughs> Yeah, learn from today. Apply it to tomorrow. Yeah, seriously. Uh, <sighs> awesome. Well, this has been a super fun conversation. Yeah, and uh, indeed. I look forward to doing it again sometime with whatever yeah. whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's been good. Hey, I love chatting with people who see see things in a similar way. It's awesome. So, yeah, and it's definitely yeah. building. A, I think there's a... I think there, tide is turning you know oh yeah it's definitely sure. and we're just probably the harbingers of just you know it's like yep it's got it's yep that's right it's we're time. turning <laughs> the barge is moving there that's a very big barge there. come on slowly it's going this way guys hey stop stop putting your feet in the water back there come on <laughs> Okay, podcast listeners, next up is Cassandra on Monday. Cassandra Reinhardt, who's like this big yin yogi on YouTube. And she and I talk about the menstrual cycle and goddesses and Wonder Woman. Actually, she and I don't talk about Wonder Woman, but I talk a lot about Wonder Woman after the show. So stay tuned. Next Monday, Cassandra Reinhardt, yin yoga, and empowering your life with the goddesses and the moon phases. That's next Monday. <laughs> Yoga Healer Real Life Show with Kate Stillman. Yoga Healer.